head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing and life forevermore. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to be very clear to receive your word in all its truth. Lord, let today be a day of restoration wherever it's needed, revelation where it's needed, and healing where it's needed. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for its promises. And we say today our hearts are open to receive every bit of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Now we're going to look at Psalm 133 a little more in depth. But before we do that, I really feel like it's important to establish something. The first thing I want to establish today is that unity is not uniformity. Now, some of you say, what in the world does that mean? There's a difference between being united and being uniform. The word unity means to become one. Whereas the word uniformity, it's the quality of having the same form. Let me give you a, an example here. I'm going to explain the difference and we'll look at it scripturally. When you think of a uniform, you think of you know, usually sports or school or workplace. People are all, they all wearing the same clothes. So the clothes look the same. Same logo, same uh, lettering. It's all the same. Uniform means the same thing and the same type of thing that does not vary at all. V-A-R-Y. It doesn't have any variance whatsoever. If it's uniform, you could take ten of them and they look exactly the same. Are you with me so far? Unity, on the other hand, means becoming one unit or becoming one. It has a connotation of, of harmony where different parts come together. Just the same as we heard vocal harmonies during the praise and worship aspect of the service this morning. There's one part, there's two parts there. Three different people, four different people singing uh, different parts of a song, saying the same words, singing it in a different way, but coming together to make one beautiful sound. How many of you, that's what unity looks like. We all, in the body of Christ, we stand firm on the same gospel regarding the kingdom of God. However, being united does not mean that we all look the same. And what I find is interesting, and we'll talk about this more in depth, but it's those differences that the things that we should celebrate end up being the things that we argue about. I mean, you've ever noticed that before. The things that make us different and the things that we should celebrate about one another are the things that maybe kind of get on each other's nerves, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's focus on this unity and what it means. Romans 12 verses 4 and 5 puts it this way. It says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. How many of you know that? Just as it is that way, verse 5, So we, though we are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. How many of you know that my finger is different than my foot, but they both are a part of my one body? It's the same thing within the body of Christ. Look around this morning, and I, actively I'm telling you that, not just to say for whatever reason. I mean, genuinely, look around the room a little bit. You don't have to break your neck and turn around if you're towards the front, but just take a look around the room for a second. There are several people who are here right now who look different than you, and they're gifted differently. God designed us that way. Isn't that awesome? To know that God designed you different than me? Could you imagine a world full of Aaron Brockmans? That would be a scary place. As I mentioned, hey, come on now. Somebody caught the Holy Ghost over here on, the, on your right side of the room. Woo! I already shared with you that organization, without my wife, this church would be in big trouble. Hey, let's just call it what it is. I mean, she knows, I know, I'm, I'm just... I, I, you know, I'm just willing to admit it. There's another message in and of itself. You've got to be willing to admit that you can't do everything and we need each other to be able to get the whole work done. Right? It's important to understand these things. God designed us that way. And it's in those various types of gifts within the body, God designed us that way to where we would need each other. Think about that for a minute. 
I want to say something to you because a lot of people think about the gifts of the Spirit just in the context of the Holy Ghost type things where there's signs and wonders and miracles and tongues, interpretation, prophetic words. Those things are true. But Scripture also talks about, I believe it's in the book of Romans. Did you know that giving is a spiritual gift? There are people that have been given. They've been endowed with financial and material blessings for the purpose of operating in God's Spirit to give. That's one example of several that I could give. So listen, I'll say this to you. Speaking in tongues is spiritual. Prophetic words are spiritual. So is the heart of a giver. It doesn't make you less spiritual if you don't stand up and give a prophetic word from the platform. God's gifted certain people in certain ways for a specific purpose. And it's because we belong to each other. How many times has there been within the church... And I'm not going to ask for specific examples, of course, but how many times has there been where somebody in the church has been in desperate need of something? And then a brother or sister will come along and say, here I am. The Lord put this on my heart. Maybe they knew about it. Maybe they didn't. But God puts it on their heart to give. See, that's what it's about. That's what it's supposed to be about. Scripture says it this way in 1 Corinthians, a passage I'm sure many of you are familiar with in chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. For the body does not consist of one member but of many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an, were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as He chose. Say, He chose. Don't compare yourself to somebody else's gifts. God gave you a specific set of gifts, not to compare the way somebody else does it, but to operate in the way He ordained for you to operate. God has arranged the members of the body. Does that not what it says in verse 18? God arranged the body the way He wants it. Now we talk about that in every facet when we talk about the local church, when we talk about capital C, the big church, the entire body of Christ. There's not a bunch of little bodies of Christ floating around. We're all part of the same body. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Like We all belong to the body of Christ as Christians. We've got brothers and sisters meeting all over the world right now or throughout today. Those are our, our brothers and sisters that are a part of the same body of Christ. But God is the one who arranges the members of the body. He's the one that put you where you are with the people that you are with right now for a specific purpose. 19, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Let me put it this way. Within the body, each part has its own purpose by design, and each of those parts of the body, benefits the entire body. And they work together. Even as I preach this morning, my tongue, my vocal cords, my lips, some maybe different parts of my body that I'm not mentioning right now. They all work together in the process of just me speaking in this very moment. More than one part of my body comes together for one specific purpose. For you to drive your car, you need your eyes on the road, Especially for some of these that are learning how to drive, you need your eyes on the road. <laughs> and all the moms and dads said. Those days are not too far away for us. You need your eyes on the road. You need your hands on the wheel. You need your feet to use the, the brake and the gas. Uh, Even the clutch, if you drive a stick, whatever that looks like. But it requires more, hear me now, just the the process of driving a vehicle requires multiple parts of your body doing different things but accomplishing the same purpose. That's the way God has arranged for the body to operate. Different people working together as God has gifted you for the benefit of of the entire church family. Thinking of all this and how we're all connected and all that, I think it's undeniable. I'm moving on to my second point. Don't worry, there's three. So if you're not getting out of it too easy, you're used to two. and No, there's three of them today. 
we think about this kind of stuff and how the body's all connected, it is undeniable that unity is God's desire for the church. How many of you know that? That's my second point. Unity is God's desire for the church. We see that in verse 1 in Psalm 133 that we read to start this message. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. When brothers come together as one. Do not tell me for one moment that God doesn't care about unity amongst His people. How many of you know that in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying what many would call the high priestly prayer. This is right before Judas is getting ready to betray Him. Listen to what Jesus prays for us. He prays for the disciples and all that. Yeah, but He prays for us too in that prayer if you read it. Listen to what Jesus says in John 17 verses 20 to 23. This is Jesus' prayer for you and for me. It says, I do not ask for these only, talking about the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's praying for us. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. amen. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I have given to them. Hallelujah. Why? That they may be one, even as we are one. In the same way that the Father and the Son are one, God desires that we be that connected. 23 says, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly, wholly, completely one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Jesus is praying in this moment, this passage we just read. He's praying for us right before He's getting ready to be betrayed, arrested, crucified. He prays for each of us that we would be united. He says, Lord, unite the people in your family in the same way that you and I are one. How many of you know you cannot be any more connected than the Father and the Son? And Jesus prays in the same way that the Father and the Son are connected. He says, so should it also be in the family of God for those who receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the result of what happens. Jesus says this in His prayer. He says, if if God's people will dwell together in unity, verse 23 says that the world is going to know that the Father sent the Son and the world's going to know that God loves us. Unity is an example of God's love. Unity in the church is an example that Jesus came. It's a testimony and a testament to the lost and broken world around us. Unity within the body of Christ is an example of God's love. So the question I believe has to be asked. Does Columbia City see the truth of the gospel? And the love of the Father in our unity as a church family. When people hear about victory, when people talk about victory, what do they say? Oh, brother, sister, so and so this, or no, 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 no. Or do they say, no, those people love God and they love each other? For the record, the greatest commandments of all, Matthew tells us that. The first and greatest command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The second greatest command is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The whole gospel, four words, love God, love people. Jesus in that passage said that all the law and all the prophets hinge on those two things. Love God and love one another. Does our community, do the people in our workplaces, anytime people hear about this particular house of worship, do people hear about love and unity or do they hear about dissension and division? Do they hear about personal opinions instead of the love of God flowing through all of us? See, that's the kind of unity that Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 15. In verses 5 and 6, he says, May the God of... (laughs) We like the second one, but not the first one. A lot of us would wish this would say, May the God of encouragement grant you... But it says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony, such unity with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with... One voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Unity within the church is a witness to the world. Can we not agree that disunity within the church has served as the opposite of that? How many church splits have we seen people uh, be caused to drive away from the family of God? How many times have there been arguments in in church gatherings and church families where people will uh, debate over colors of chairs and carpets and finishes on walls and whether or not Adam had a belly button and, and all these dumb things. There have been church splits over stuff like this. And we wonder why the world isn't drawn to God who is love when the world doesn't look anything or when the church doesn't look anything like the God of love that we say we follow after. Unity matters, friends. Unity is a witness. Unity within the body of Christ is a witness. We've got to remember that. You know, we can't have we're not perfect and I understand it. And this is not me coming and smacking anybody over the head. This is just a reminder. You know, bickering and moaning and complaining caused the children of Israel to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. There was disunity in the camp and they missed out, that generation missed out on the promised land because of it. Don't tell me God doesn't care about unity. Don't tell me He doesn't care about obedience. How many of you know we're all not, none of us are perfect? Me too. We're not perfect. There's things that you guys do sometimes that drive me nuts. Let me, yeah, let me finish. Let me finish. Don't get offended. Let me finish. I'm sure there's things I do that drive you crazy. That family that's sitting two rows behind you, there's probably something they've said at one point or another that you're like, I don't know if I really agree with that. I thought love was supposed to cover a multitude of sins. Is your love for the person next to you bigger than the offense that they may have placed on you? Can you imagine if Jesus was as, in, as vindictive as people are in the church? <laughs> That's a scary thought. Can you imagine if Jesus prayed the way some of us pray when we're mad at somebody else? All right, listen, are you hearing me? Oh, that person said something mean about me. Go get him, Lord. Oh, don't act all high and mighty. You've probably done it. Within the family of God. Lord, you heard what that person said. I don't agree with it. You need to correct him. Friends, recognize that we're not perfect. You are not perfect. I'm not perfect. Isn't there a passage of Scripture that says if you see a speck in your brother's eye, the way you're best able to deal with that is you get the gigantic log out of your own first? What's the moral of that story? Go to the Lord with your stuff first. We're so good at recognizing other people's filth that's this big when we ignore the one that's in front of our face that's way larger and it's our own. We're human and that means that we're all a work in progress. Again, me too. We're all a work in progress by the grace of God. But that leads me to my next point. If we're all imperfect, it means that unity has to be and it must be maintained. Unity doesn't just happen, friends. Relationship doesn't just happen. Encouraging one another requires some effort. Maintaining peace requires some effort. Because again, none of us are perfect. There are going to be disagreements. There are going to be things that we say and do that may not be fully jiving with what you think I should say and do and vice versa. But I just want you to understand the importance of this. Unity must be maintained. How many here know that, don't elbow them, family can drive you crazy sometimes. How many of you know that family can drive you a little loopy at moments? Spouse, kids, extended family. Whoo! My son's over there laughing because he's like, yeah, Dad, I thought, yeah, you probably drive me crazy. <laughs> Just admit it. Family can get on family's nerves. How many of you know that can also be true within the family of God? 
See, the problem is that I find we want a false sense of unity where we don't deal with any of the issues. We just all pretend that we like each other, but we leave things swept under the rug. But you've heard me use this analogy before. You can only sweep so much under the rug before you trip over it. There are hard conversations that have to happen sometimes, but they have to be done in love and encouragement, building each other up. I'm gonna, I mean, it's obvious. Different perspectives and life circumstances can sometimes bring out some of the things in us that are not so good. And unfortunately, some of the ways that comes out are things that we might do and say to each other. How many of you know that the enemy would like nothing more than to take the small and petty things and make them wedges in relationships in the house of God? Drive wedges in ministry relationships. People that maybe work together in a common area of the church. Look, there's a reason the Bible has so much to say about unity and maintaining it. Because the enemy seeks to destroy. I mean, I got newsflash for you. If you haven't been paying attention to the spiritual condition of this church for the last two months, I'm about to lay it down for you right now. Early March, I preached a message called It's Time to Occupy. Talked about the Lord is calling His people to, to advance the kingdom and take ground and stand firm in it. Why are we surprised that there's been a lot of silly, petty, goofiness that's happened around the house of the Lord? I'm not saying we actively welcome it, but don't be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Maintaining unity requires some effort. It requires the things that are mentioned in Ephesians 4 and verses 1 through 3. Listen to this. The writer of Ephesians says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you. He's not saying it's just a good idea. He's saying, I'm telling you, you need this. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. How do we do that? How do we walk in a manner that's worthy of God's calling for our lives as individuals? The first thing is with humility. It's a lowliness of mind. Jesus, the example, taking the form of a servant. Being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Saying, you know what? I could tell you all what to do, but I'm going to wash your feet. How do we maintain unity? Being humble. Serving one another. Not using other people as a step stone to advance your ministry, but standing alongside your brothers and sisters with the hope that you'll elevate them in the process. With humility and gentleness. That's a literal definition. I'm going to give you an example of what Gentleness should look like. Because when we talk about gentleness, it's usually in the connotation of correction. When there's a disagreement of some sort or something's off, gentleness is required. We should be gentle with each other. Harshness accomplishes nothing, friends. Can I say that to you? Being harsh with people doesn't accomplish anything. All it does is a harsh word. It's a proverb. A harsh word stirs up what? Anger. Gentleness. I'm going to give you a picture in the context of the body of Christ. This is what gentleness looks like. Even in correction, it's just like cleaning the body. I want you to pretend I've got a gigantic spot on my leg right here. It's filthy, it's dirty, it's gross. I should have done this as a, an illustrated thing, but whatever. We're just going to pretend I, my leg is filthy right now. Now my hand, another part of the body, comes along carries the responsibility to come and serve in the act of helping to make my leg clean again. But how many of you know that when I clean my leg, I'm going to be careful not to rip the skin off? How many of you know usually when you scrub something really hard, you can take off a little more than you meant to? I mean, I... I see this happen in the body of Christ all the time. We take something that should be good, something that's cleansing and pure and holy, and instead of using it in the context of all we want to do is remove the filth, 
There's no gentleness involved when we take it and we scrub and we scrub and we scrub. And we've addressed the dirt, but now we've left a wound. Friends, we've got to have gentleness with each other. That's the, I mean, that's the call. We have to be humble, understanding that it's not just about you, it's not just about me, it's about all of us. We have to be gentle with each other. How do we maintain unity? Another way, with patience, bearing with one another. I wish I had some awesome Greek explanation where I could tell you that, that bearing with one another means something different. But I got news, friends, it means exactly what it says. You want to know the official definition of the phrase bearing with one another? It means putting up with one another. <laughs> yeah. When you hear that phrase, put up with someone or something, usually it does not have the connotation of they're doing or saying something you like. How I many of you have ever used the phrase, I'm not going to put up with that? As a parent, how I many of you say, I'm not going to put up with that? Where I grew up, the, the word nonsense was attached to that. I'm not going to put up with that nonsense. To put up with one another. One of the ways we maintain unity is i got to put up with the stuff about you that I don't really like. That my flesh would say, well, you're wrong. Your attitude's off. I don't like that about you. Awesome. Could you imagine we could have a whole church service filled with people getting offended by taking a piece of paper, passing it all out, and let's all write up things about each other that we don't care for. I don't like that you talk to people that way. I don't like that you watch these movies. I don't like that you sing these songs. I don't like that you uh, had this friendship with that person. I don't like, I don't, I don't, I don't. Friends, it has nothing to do with that. What about the grace of God that's been extended to you? What about that same grace that's supposed to be extended from us toward one another? Love God. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the same way. We all, I love me some me. I think I was Terrell Owens back in the day, football player. I love me some me. Very prideful thing to say, of course. But we all will do, in many cases, what we need to do to align ourselves to have a good, strong, healthy life. I mean, that's just common sense, right? Unless the Holy Spirit specifically tells you, you're probably not going to put yourself in a bad position. But the Bible says we're supposed to love our neighbor as, in the same manner that, we love ourselves. So that means my desire is not just that I am in a good position myself. My desire is that you are too. If you're going through something, how can I come to you and help you get to a better place? How can I encourage you to walk in the fullness of God's plans for your life? Friends, the gospel at its very core is selfless. It's about encouraging one another. It's about strengthening each other. It's about being patient with one another even when we don't feel like it. Can I say something to you and, and, and this might come across as offensive but I'm preaching it myself as well as I'm preaching to you. Any outburst is a lack of patience. How many of you know that? The Bible does say you can be angry without sin. But an outburst that's a lack of patience. How many of you know that patience whether you like it or not is a fruit of the Spirit? It's mentioned in Galatians 5. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. There are others. Gentleness was one of those, by the way. Patience. We don't like patience. It means I've got to put up with something or someone that I don't want to put up with. Can you imagine? Yet again, I'll use the example of Jesus. Can you imagine if Jesus felt the same way about you? that maybe you feel about somebody else. Can you imagine if Jesus had the same level of patience with you that maybe you have with somebody else? Friends, it's a big deal. This is one of the biggest areas that the enemy will try to attack the body of Christ. This is one of the biggest ways the enemy will try to attack your family, just within your own house. Arguments in the family even are issues of a lack of patience, forbearance, long-suffering, being willing to put up 
with one another, even when our flesh doesn't feel like it. But we're called in that passage to be humble, to be gentle, to put up with each other, and be eager, urgent, to maintain unity. What does it mean to maintain unity? The word maintain in the original language, New Testament passage, so it would be in the Greek. The word maintain means to guard it, to keep an eye on it, and to prevent it from escaping. So what is unity in the church? How big of a deal is unity within the body of Christ? It's a big enough deal that the writer of the book of Ephesians says you need to be eager to do everything you possibly can to guard unity amongst yourself. Keep an eye on it. Pay attention to it. Be aware of the enemy's schemes and devices that would try to drive a wedge in any way, shape, or form. These things are at the heart of what you find in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. Paul says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by doing what? Being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. How can we do that? Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Unity within the body of Christ is only maintained when we live together in this way. You cannot have unity in the body of Christ if you have selfish people. Now listen, I know it's a word from the Lord for today because He changed it on me last night. If you have any idea how much I hate putting together a message at the last minute, just personally, myself, I can't stand having that weight over my shoulders. Now I'm not trying to say I hate when God speaks to me. I want you to understand. My flesh doesn't like the pressure of having to put a message together shortly before I have to preach it. I like to have time to meditate on it and pray. But I know this is a word for right now. I know there are people here probably today that are feeling a little bit uncomfortable. It's good. It's not the Holy Spirit telling you you're awful. It's His conviction. Conviction brings life when you respond in the right way. God doesn't show up and say you're a horrible person. He says, look, there's sin in your life, but I have the solution. Repent. Receive God's grace and mercy. Be set free. And walk and live in that freedom. Unity can only be maintained with a heart of servanthood, a heart of selflessness, humility, being gentle, being patient with one another, and having a desire to hold it together. Friends, can you imagine what this specific church family would look like if all of us had the mentality to say, you know what, I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure all of us are on the same page going after God together. That's not just the job of the pastor, friends. That's all of us. That's your responsibility just as it is mine. Now, I have more responsibility and I have to answer to God because I'm in a position of leadership. I get that. I'm responsible in a different kind of way, but we all bear the load together. Unity in the family of God should matter just as much to you as it does to me. See, here's the deal. We talk about revival, God's glory, the power, the manifest presence of God. We want to receive all that God has for us. Friends, it's when the church truly understands and lives by the principles that we've talked about today. That's when we can see the promises of God's blessing. When you look at our main passage in Psalm 133, there's something I want you to grab a hold of. Because I believe that this was something that jumped off of the pages at me last night. In Psalm 133, we see something in verse 2. There's two things. We'll look at verse 3 as well here in just a moment. But for right now. Dwelling together in unity in our main passage is compared to two things. The first thing, in verse 2, unity, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's like the precious, beautiful, sweet oil on the head running down on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. So what does that mean? Unity is like oil. What does that mean? Unity is like oil. Friends, we're not just talking about some random oil here. We're talking about the oil that ran down Aaron's beard. Who was Aaron? He was the first high priest. 
The oil that ran down Aaron's beard was not a random oil. It was the oil that was specially blended and ordained by God to anoint the tabernacle, to anoint the Ark of the Covenant, to anoint Aaron and his sons for the priesthood, and to anoint other things for the purpose of setting them apart and making them holy. Unity sets God's people apart. Unity makes His people holy. Hear me now. Unity qualifies the church to be in the most holy place. Don't tell me God doesn't care about it. We have a a parallel in Scripture that says, if you are dwelling together in unity, that is the same thing as the oil that was used to consecrate and set apart things to be in the most holy place and the manifest presence of God. That's why the enemy can't stand unity. That's why the enemy attacks unity. Because he doesn't want God's people to dwell there. He doesn't want God's people to dwell in his manifest presence. So what's he going to do? Everything within his power to cause division. To cause frustration. A lot of times it's not the big stuff. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. How many of you have heard that one before? I'm telling you, friends, this stuff matters. And this isn't just some rah-rah message. You want to talk about being in revival and seeing God move? we got to get this right. This is required. This is not optional. We want to enter into the most holy things of God. It is through unity that God pours His oil over His people and says, you are set apart. Unity in that main passage. I'm going to read out the New Living Translation for verse 3. Unity or harmony, it says in that particular translation, is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon. If you know anything about Mount Hermon, snow-capped all year round. So what does that mean? There's a consistent flow of dew that comes off that mountain all the time. The dew doesn't stop. That's what I want you to grab here. Unity is as refreshing as a dew from the mountain that's always producing dew falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced His blessing, even life everlasting. Now that word pronounced is pretty important. Some of your translations will say, the Lord has commanded the blessing. The word in its original definition means to establish or constitute. So I want you to think about what unity does. Unity aligns us to be in the manifest presence of God. Can I say this? Without unity, we'll never see it. Individuals might be able to, but as a, as a house... Of, my prayer for this church family is for all of us together that this is a house of God's glory. More than anything else, I don't care about the music. I don't care about the, the, how awesome a soliloquy I can come up with when I'm standing up here preaching or any, anything else. This has to be a place. And every church should feel this way. This has to be a place where the manifest presence of God dwells. And we must be a people where the manifest presence of God dwells. All day, every day. But I'm telling you, for a church family, for a congregation to experience that, unity is required. That oil is poured over us to set us apart as holy. gives us access to the most holy place. That oil flows from that Mount Hermon, so to speak. That dew comes and gives life to everything that it touches. And it's within that unity that God commands, He establishes, He constitutes His blessing. If we want this to be a house where God establishes His blessing, it requires that we live with a heart of unity. Are we going to agree all the time? Say it with me. Is everybody going to feel that that, that everything should be exactly the same all the time. No. But we have to have a heart to love one another, a heart to serve one another, and to stand with each other.